we're back in Colossians again. <laughs> Um, This is number three out of the third chapter, and we will be looking at kind of around verses six and seven. I'm going to go back and read verse five because I need it as the launching pad to continue on. So last week we looked and we studied this word mortify, mortify, put to death, make like dead, uh, dead in therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Now, this is important because I want you to take a look just real quickly at how the apostle addresses certain things. See, I love the fact that if you're reading with the eyes kind of just open... Um, you can never get the fact, Paul never says, and I was not part of this. He's always including himself and using the general we, us. Um, I love the fact that here the address is, we have to go back and look at why, for which things sake the wrath of God, is exactly in concert with what happens before. This, we'll call it, uh, inappropriate sexual behavior and the abuses, if you will, of the things of God for which sake, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. So the first thing I want to address and talk about really, the, pretty much the whole message, is going to be uh, addressing the wrath of God. But I want to preface this by saying I think it's fair to say in, um, goodness, now 16 years of ministry, I don't really think I've touched the subject, um, not in depth anyway. Um, The late Dr. Scott taught abundantly when he was teaching out of Romans, but I, I still think sometimes we can study a word, we can study its meaning, but... I think sometimes we can still not get why it's important. And in this day and age, I believe we're living in an age where um, it seems as though there are no consequences um, for whatever people's behavior is. You can act as bad, as wicked, as evil, and people act as though their behavior... Would you agree to say that people act like there's no consequences? That's because if you talk to people about the wrath of God, the first thing they'd probably tell you is that anyone who believes in God in this day and age is a moron. Um, Number two, that no such thing could exist because if, if people do believe in God, God is a God of love. And that's where I, I have my aha, got you moment. You see, you cannot have love, love in God's way, not in our human way. You cannot have love without other reactions to that, we'll call it attribute. And let me kind of say this this way. You can't have love. Let's talk on a human plane first because it's easy for us to identify. You can, you can love without being jealous, but there's also the potential that loving deeply can produce jealousy. You can love deeply and not have your love reciprocated. That could bring resentment. That could bring hatred. There, So love can generate different emotions if not received or understood properly. Have you ever, and I've asked this question before, in some of you in your younger years, when you were out there courting, did you ever meet someone that you had great affection or you had some something for, but it wasn't reciprocal, it didn't go the other way. So you had that, you experienced that, whether you want to call it rejection of desire, and that in turn, over time, leads to, if you think about it, if you've ever had a heartbreak like that, you may not have had love for the person, but the the initial steps of interest or infatuation or affection that once rejected or once quelled change and morph into other emotions. Do you know what I'm saying? So now take all of that, that's only on the human plane, and take it up to a place where we can't even understand. So anybody that says God is love, 
Well, they've got one part of it right. God is not just God is love. God is all power because if God was just all love and no power, he wouldn't be God. But part of God's attribute, if you will, or part of it, it's very difficult because we're now getting into trying to define God, which is impossible. But in discussing this wrath of God, the first thing we know is it's his wrath. So somebody might say, well, why? Why should this doctrine even concern me? Because I'm interested in salvation and I'm interested in forgiveness. I'm interested in the things I'm interested in. And that's good and well, but we preach the whole counsel of God. Now, to the child of God in Christ, and I have to say this at the get-go because there are people that when I talk about the wrath of God, they completely are tuning out everything and going, oh my God, what's she saying? Am I gonna, something, what's going to happen to me? For the child of God in Christ, you're okay. Don't worry about it. There is no wrath that's going to be poured out on you. You are in him. He's in you. But to better understand a couple of things need to be said. First of all, where we are at currently. So to understand where we're at currently, you've got to go back about 280 years to the message that was preached July 18th. I think it, I said 280, 17, 14, I believe, or it could be 41, not quite sure. Jonathan Edwards preached the sermon, Sinners at the Hands of an Angry God. And if you study the sermon, it's worth reading, by the way, Although most people would say very antiquated and, you know, to, to, to preach that God could possibly pour out his wrath upon people oh, in this day and age. But then, as the message was preached, people heard that and it stirred them inside to consider the consequences of their behavior without repentance and without God. So as much as we can ridicule, and people in this day and age would ridicule that sermon preached that long ago, it had an impact on this country. It was preached in New England and had a great impact in the great awakening in this country. Now, parents with young children, okay, you don't really, in your heart of hearts, you don't want to discipline your child, but you know you have to when your child does something that requires discipline, true or false, okay? Now, you can be incredibly mad at your child for doing something. This happens even between spouse, between friends, but I'm using the example here because it fits exactly what I'm trying to say. You can be incredibly mad at your child. I have one girlfriend of mine who's got several young children, and she once told me of a story, and I won't get into too much detail, but, you know, a three-and-a-half-year-old boy finds his way into mom's pantry, uh, flour everywhere in every part of the house, chocolate syrup everywhere, anything that you can think of spreading anywhere in the house, and it's everywhere, all right? Mom was pretty mad. She, I mean, she first was thought it was funny, but then in the cleanup moment, it was like, no, it was not funny at all. So, okay, you discipline your child. You know, the child will do things, but failure to discipline the child basically lets it keep on doing bad behavior. There are no consequences, so you keep doing that, and you just keep doing it. In fact, you get more bold and more brazen each time. So there's a requirement on the behalf of a parent to discipline the child. The anger that one might have doesn't last, you know, it may last for a couple of hours and then it dissipates. Now there's forgiveness and there's, we move on from the discipline stage back into, we'll call it the normal functioning of the family unit. So I ask you, as children of the living God, what type of God, what type of father in heaven would we serve if he didn't mete out discipline on his children, and that's all his children. We're not just talking about Christians. This is a misnomer for people. They go, oh, it's only on, you know, I just said to you, the wrath of God will not be poured out on Christians, but there is such a thing as discipline. There is such a thing as understanding the why of why this doctrine is so important. So, as I said, what type of parent, if you're looking at God as father, if he didn't pour out discipline. But take this a notch further, because you may have rebellious children, 
but then take it to the place of not just mild rebellion, but refusal at all to acknowledge that God created, that God is, that he is at the core of everything, including the breath that's in your lungs or the thoughts that are in your brain. He's behind it all. Failure to acknowledge him is what the book of Romans talks about when it says there is a righteousness revealed uh, from heaven, there's also the wrath of God that is being revealed. Both of these things come for us as we have the free will to choose what we or what pathway or what direction we go in. So it's important to understand that the wrath of God is not something that we can equate to human behavior. That's the first mistake people make. We get mad, God gets mad, same thing. No, not the same thing. See, when we get mad, our anger, I'm not going to say all the time, but if you analyze your own behavior, you analyze you. I don't want to analyze you. I analyze me. If you analyze your own behavior, sometimes you get mad or you get angry. Uh, it could be ego or pride. There's a, there's a lot of variables. But not seldom, if ever, is our anger righteous. All right? Now, God's anger is righteous, righteous indignation, something being done. And we can have that, but it's usually we don't experience the the same type of thing that God does. Something that is being done that's hurting the body of Christ, something that is directly affecting the church or the members of the church. These are things that we have to consider. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about the wrath of God, it is typically provoked, okay? And just to give you an idea so we can get clarity, and it's important because I really believe if we have a right understanding of this doctrine, number one, you and I will not be afraid or scared, and number two, we'll understand why it must be preached in the whole counsel of God to make people understand that God says, grace is the message for those that will hear, but for those that will not hear, there is another message. So let's look first at how I use the word provoked. Uh, You find the clearest example in Deuteronomy 9, in verse 7. This is just on the heels of those folks being called a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not, Deuteronomy 9, verse 7, page 257, if you have a Bible like mine. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came into this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. So, It's important to note something, and I'm going to start right here because this is kind of how, it's very difficult to get into this. God's wrath is just that, it is his, belongs to him, and he can be provoked. And the provocation, as you can see with the children of Israel, the, the key word here is rebellious against the Lord and provoke the Lord to wrath. And this was a pattern with the children of Israel, um, If you think about it, his anger is not just there. It's a response to something. He's not an angry God. He's responding to behavior. So that's the first thing you got to look at. The second thing you got to look at is, and this is a question that people often ask on a regular basis. So why then does God not do something about evil? Why does he let evil remain? For example, the children of Israel. Why didn't he do what he did? He got tired of them being rebellious, mouthing off and murmuring, and basically he strewn their bones in the wilderness. That's basically what God, if you want to look at God's wrath, God's wrath is not necessarily limited to, for example, the flood, where God flooded. That that was an act of God's wrath, as he said, He saw the evil that was in man's heart, humanity at large. And from God's vantage point, he would just wipe the earth clean and start over. Now, what separates that act 
from this act. What happens here in Deuteronomy is actually quite pivotal to our understanding about the wrath of God. Actually, from Exodus forward, we begin to understand why there is something we gotta, we got to grab hold of. So before the law, God did get angry. Before the law, there were certain things that God did in his anger, if you will, in his reaction to sinful behavior, to rebellious behavior. But not many times. And what he did do when he did it, for example, I mentioned the flood. Take a look at Sodom and Gomorrah. God was willing to spare if there would have been even one righteous person there in Sodom and Gomorrah. But no, he, there was none. So fire and brimstone burns or takes away, eradicates Sodom and Gomorrah. So you've got several instances pre, pre-giving of the law that show you God's mindset. If you go to those incidences before the law, it is directly in correlation to evil that has taken hold at such a deep level. The sinfulness that existed was not just something on a superficial level, but was so deeply embedded into the heart of man that God said, I must eradicate. You can't get rid of this evil, so you've got to just get rid of everything. But when the law was given, that changed everything. And why do I say that? Let me read this to you, and I think it'll, this will make it abundantly clear as to why I say the law changed everything. I'll read this to you. Um, Paul writes, Because the law worketh wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So this is an important thing that's said there. I just quoted Romans 4.15. Why is that important? The law brought the wrath of God because prior to the giving of the law, whatever one did in ignorance, or even if you were aware, there was no law, so there could be no transgression. So God may have reacted to the evil on the earth, but not to a particular, more of a general. But once the law came about, the law brought about wrath. Because now man is confronted with seeing what is God's right way and the evil that is in our hearts that leads us another way. And then you can see why I used the example out of Deuteronomy 9. Rebellious against the Lord, provoked the Lord to wrath. These two phrases must be taken together. So I don't want us to look at this message and think somehow God is so sensitive. He's, he's got such a thin skin that, my goodness, he's offended by all this. What is it that brings about the wrath of God? And we can settle this down into a neat little box. It's called sin. God's reaction to his creation that he created, that he loves, that he desired to be conformed to the image and likeness of his son, that he desired for better and greater things, brings about wrath on those who, as I'm kind of combining a little bit of Romans and here and there, but the idea is those who would know God from the creation, who would understand that God did create, but reject, refuse. Now, all you've got to do is think in today's realm, okay? You have more people that believe, I mean, listen, I tell you, you have a right to believe whatever you want. You, you can believe whatever you want and go float it somewhere. <laughs> but there's one thing you're not going to escape. I'm sorry, this is not a personal opinion. If that book is true, God created everything. Now imagine, i got to pick an example here. We'll make this the corniest, stupidest example, but let's just go with it. So, uh, John, you baked a cake. You baked a big, beautiful cake for the whole congregation to eat. But when John brings the cake out, no one acknowledges that John baked the cake. In fact, they don't thank him. They don't even say, wow, just look what this guy did. In fact, what they do is they go over here to Henry and they say, Henry, good job with the cake. Now, in my example, John obviously is God the creator, and here is the mass populace. Cannot even see, will not acknowledge, refuse, reject, deny 
does not exist. You didn't bake that cake. It just happened. It, all the ingredients just somehow were in the bowl. You threw it up, and it came down, and presto, it's a cake. And there you have evolution. <laughs> the wrath of God, if you want to look at it that way, why wouldn't God be angry? This guy over here is getting all the credit. You know, that's what God... Sorry to say this. It may sound a little cheap and cheesy, but that, that is what God wants. He wants us to acknowledge he made it for us, for us to prosper, for us to grow, for us to understand. But no, we, we, we have to put our spin on it. So the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. And I'm just giving you one example. This is what Romans 1 talks about. Worshiping the creature instead of the creator. So we have some very plain, simple thoughts on this. But when you go into the Gospels, you get an even more interesting take on this. So I'll take you to a couple of places and show you a few things. If you turn to John's Gospel and the third chapter, in that most beloved and well-quoted passage in the third chapter, moving down to uh, the last verse of that chapter, 336. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, I want you to think about that. The person who faiths, who trusts Christ, has everlasting eternal life. But the one who does not shall not see life. That means shall not see the same life as the one who faiths. But the wrath of God abides on him, presently, currently, not future. See, there's two wraths going, and that's the other thing people tend to homogenize. There's wrath to the individual, and then there is wrath that would be poured out during the tribulation, the great tribulation, the last week of that, we'll call it, time of existence on earth. So there's two dynamics working. There is the individual who is storing up on themselves, although they are storing it up onto themselves, it has not yet been dumped. Think about that. So what does that mean? And let me explain this, because this is where people don't go usually. Failure to understand this and failure to understand why this is so necessary brings you to a real tough tough spot. And that tough spot is that if someone does not wake up, you know what God does? He basically lets the person. There's no hindrance anymore. There's no no tapping on the shoulder. There's there's none of that. He lets you go your own way. Whatever your desire is, like that three-and-a-half-year-old boy who wants to go in the mom's pantry, he lets you do what you want and indulge in whatever it is to go your own way. He, he basically says, okay, I've been coming at you with my gift of the Holy Spirit. I've been coming at you with my gift of love. I've preveniently tapped you on the shoulder. I've been talking to you through my word, through the Spirit, but you've refused, you've rejected. Now, this is not like God does this immediately. Why? God is slow to anger. But after a time, God does turn people over. And I think people don't understand what that means to be turned over means whatever it is that is in your heart, that is your preference, the thing that drives you, God will say, okay, you want that? Here, and I'm going to give you a lot of it because you need to knock yourself out here because this is all you're going to get. Except most people don't want to hear that last part. That's all you're going to get. That's why that says those who trust have life everlasting, but those who don't shall not have life, but the wrath of God abides on them. The wrath of God says, okay, keep going. You keep going. You keep going. Now, take it to, again, a secular position. We have this issue now with people trying to reinvent the wheel with our legal system. I'll be the first person to tell you, 
we need, we do need prison reform. There's no question. And not, not as I've heard for the last 10 or 20 years. I know because I've been in those institutions. I know what needs to happen. I've seen with my own eyes. But in terms of our system, our whole judicial system, for the most part, it works. For the most part. But could you imagine if justice occurred like this, which, by the way, is kind of occurring right now? So you commit any crime you want, and instead of facing the wrath of the law that comes back to you that, that, that says, you are going to prison, you're going to pay a fine, there's going to be consequences. Commit a crime now? Go on. You're free to go. Go on. You're free to go. Now, what does that promote? That promotes more lawlessness because there are no consequences. We can just get more emboldened to do more, bigger, and better. And this is the big problem. You see, people think, I choose to be a person of the book or not. But you see, the problem is that in this world, the way this world has been created and the way it functions, the first institution of law given by God, and then man took up that institution of God's law and implemented it for the people of this society to live in. So failure to comply with that should bring consequences. No? So failure to enforce those consequences brings another level on a greater scale of more lawlessness. That's pretty much what we've been seeing in this country. And failure to eradicate that, you know, if you let something go, does it get better on its own? So, all I'm telling you is, you know, you can't make the wrath of God into a caricature. You cannot bring it down to our human level, but you can see that embedded in our understanding of our own society are principles that come right back to the book. So if I am trying to understand what all this means, I can take another page here. Let me go back to, uh, actually, let me go forward, take you into a couple of references, but one particular reference that I think we ought to look at, which is in Mark 3 and verse 5. But I'll read from the beginning of the third chapter, Mark 3, and I want to talk about this for a minute. Many people say, it's the God of the Old Testament who's wrathful, and he's nasty, and he's mean, and he's just terrible. But, oh, the God of the New Testament, he's a loving God. Same God, folks, in case you are confused. Same God. Same God who can get angry. And wrathful. And I'm going to show you how this works. Mark 3, it says, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when when he had looked around about on them with anger. That word is our word for wrath. The Greek word is orge. If you read it in English, it looks like orgy. You heard that in church. And when he looked around about on them with anger, with wrath, being grieved for their hardness of their hearts, he saith to the man, stretch forth thine hand, stretch it out. His hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth straightway, took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Don't say that Jesus never exuded this attribute right here. He looked around on them with wrath, not anger. The Greek word is our word for wrath. What's more important, tell me that Jesus did not act in a wrathful way when he rid the temple of the money changers. Tell me that that was gentle Jesus begging and pleading with the soft, syrupy voice and clasped hands in prayer. Brothers, please, please, please leave the temple now. Please, for the Father's sake. No, he basically, if we could know what that scene was like, he was probably saying, get the hell out of here with that whip. 
going after them. And trust me, there's a lot in this modern day I'd like to do that to, too. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, maybe stepping on God's territory. He'll, they'll get theirs. Um, you almost have to look for these things. When, when John the Baptist is preaching, and I love this one because it, it kind of sets the stage here. When John the Baptist is preaching, you have the Sadducees and the Pharisees come to John's baptism. That would be in Matthew 3 and verse 7. They came to his baptism, and he says to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So no question, even these diehard religious folks understood what that, mean, what that meant, the wrath to come. That we're talking about future judgment. It's the same people that Jesus in Matthew 23 pronounces woes on and says to them, generation of vipers. So you can see, if you glean from all of this, what triggers, just in the New Testament, what triggers the wrath or the ire of Jesus is religiosity, religious superficiality, hypocrisy, all of the stuff that people would like to call religion, which I think God must find as an affront instead of worshiping him in truth and in spirit, we find every other thing to do other than that which he has asked us. So it's very plain to see we need to understand, which we're doing right now piece by piece, the words that we will encounter. So the primary word for wrath being used over and over again is the Greek word orge or orgy. There is another Greek word that will appear, and in your King James, sometimes when they translate anger or wrath, they will be interchangeably used. The other word is thumos. Now, to make a distinction between the two, and I will tell you, before the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation or version of the Old Testament, before the Septuagint, these words, these two Greek words, were distinctly separate. As the translators used these words in their translation for the Septuagint, they got very muddled. But make no mistake that by the time you get into the New Testament, the distinction between the two words is very clear. For what God does, God's activity, God's anger, God's wrath, God's fury, the word is going to be primarily orge or orge. When we have a reaction to God's orders, his words, his activity, or sideways, man to man, we will experience thumos. Now, to help you remember, just remember one thing. Thumos, think of a thermos. You put stuff in to keep it hot, right? So in a thermos, you want your coffee or whatever you put in there to be hot and to stay hot. That's thumos. You're, you're hot under the collar. Orge or orge is the expression of that uh, emotion. So although they seem like semantics, they are not. We can say, for example, I went through to look at distinct patterns, and I'll show a few of them to you. Um, Luke 4 and 28. Now, this comes at the very end, basically, of Jesus being rejected. And it says, that 20th verse says, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. So this thumos, they were filled, they were, they were boiling under the collar. They didn't say anything. They didn't express it. They were boiling under the collar what they heard Jesus say. That's thumos. Okay? You have another example I'll show you because... You can maybe get a pattern here. Acts, book of Acts 19 and verse 28. <clears throat> this is after the um, talk at Ephesus, and there incurs kind of a big riffraff amongst the people. When they heard these sayings, they were filled with wrath. The sayings of Paul preaching about, uh, you've got this whole explosion here. Um, when they heard these sayings, they were filled f full of wrath and cried out saying, greatest Diana of the Ephesians. So, and again, that word is thumos. So let's not be confused because 
The translators, if you look, you'll find even in our text. So I'll show you why I'm explaining this as well. Turn to Colossians again and check out verse 6. Take a look where it says, if you have a Bible like mine, there'll be a number beside wrath in the sixth verse, which is 3709, which is our word orge. And if you look down in verse 8, it says, but now he also put off all these, anger. Anger is also 3709. You see that? Same number, same word. They just kind of confused It's almost like they couldn't just stick to one thing, so they had to mix it up. So I'm trying to sort this out for you so you can see that they are distinct words, even though the English is terribly confusing there. Um, So now, the ultimate thing. Let's look back for a second. Remember, on the heels of what I described in verse 5, which is why, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. You notice something, Paul does not condemn the people. He says, you were there too. You lived that lifestyle too. You were part of that too. See, that's part of the problem and part of my issue with the church. I'm just going to tell you, I have issues, okay? I'm not going to hide them. My issue with the church is you have people that have been in the church for 20, 30, 40 years, and they may have been walking with the Lord for the last 20, 30 years, but somehow they forget their genesis, their beginning. Their beginning is like every, every other person's beginning. You didn't come out of the gate, I'm speaking of the womb, with a little uh, halo around your head and uh, cherubim singing your praise. It didn't happen that way, okay? Uh, you can think that you were the most angelic, great baby, and you might have been to your folks, but you were still, as we all were, and came into this world, children of disobedience. That's the label for every living soul. See, why I said I have an issue with this is because for many years when I first came into the church and much of my early experience, it was like, hey, we have two categories of people. We have the frozen, chosen, saved people, and we have the people that just came a little later in life. And this is the riffraff, and this is the good stuff. No, sorry, folks, you're all riffraff. We're all riffraff, okay? Get it straight. When you get that straight, then you can see that God in his goodness put his spirit in you to change the riffraff into something that he says, wow, that is my masterpiece. Don't think you made it. He did. Failure to give him credit is what brings wrath. Failure to recognize him. These are the things that people don't want to talk about. You know why? Because it seems like such an antiquated doctrine. We don't need to know about this. Really? A petulant God who gets angry or mad because he's not recognized? If you have that attitude, you haven't even begun to understand what awaits you. So, don't you just love the way I say that? God's wrath is his love in action or reaction to sin. That's the bottom line. What type of God would he be if he had no reaction at all? Right. That's what I said. So, we can discern a few things from this text, and we can also discern a few things for ourselves. Uh, Beginning with, the wrath of God is not something that we as Christians should try and hide or be embarrassed about. Essentially, what I love about this, and I do, I've really come to wrap my mind around this one part here. God is, we'll say it this way, God doesn't take any BS, You might think he's not doing anything right now, but that's what that verse says. The wrath of God abideth on him. You won't even be aware. You think, I don't even need that stuff called the Bible, God, or church. I'm good on my own. Go about your own way, and again, God will basically give you a little push. He'll give you a nice little shove just to get you going out the door, okay? So don't think you're doing God a favor somehow, God's doing you the favor. See, we have everything skewed. Everything is upside down. We, we have people who believe they're doing God a favor by showing up. They're doing God a favor by whatever it is. It doesn't work that way. God's doing us the blessing by letting us stay and remain, even though we are, as we are, as Paul says, 
and were children of disobedience and still probably vacillate between the two camps. And the only thing that is our salvation is Jesus Christ. So what is important? The questions we must ask. Who is the recipient of God's wrath? Who, if we start cataloging religious oppressors, uh, self-righteous people who are of the religious ilk, that is, they are, they are up there on that special echelon while you and me were down here as peons. We never made it to their level. The rejectors of Christ, rejectors of his word, the ungodly, the wicked. In fact, if you really want to really understand this concept, turn to Romans, as it's right there as plain as day. And you should have lots of scribbles in your Bible in this chapter. For the wrath of God, 118, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Stop right there. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That concept of perhaps knowing and rejecting, knowing and twisting, knowing and denying, knowing and confusing, knowing and refusing to communicate the truth, that's all in that body of Uh, what's being said here. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. See, there's nowhere you can escape. I I don't care who you talk to. You can talk to anybody who can talk to somebody who only believes in evolution. You cannot escape this. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And you don't think that goes on today? I want you to really think about it. Either the Bible is ongoing, that is, happened in the past, but it's still going on today, which I believe, and I believe this. I believe that there are more people like this in the world Now, God can still open their eyes. God can still wake them up. He can do that. I can't. No individual can. This is the lunacy, by the way, to think preachers who think that they can persuade people. That's only the flesh being persuaded. That's not the spirit of God because the spirit of God doesn't need to be persuaded. So take a look at this. Because when they they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So God does not get the glory. And God does not get to say, hey, nice cake, God, right? We go to Henry over there and we say, oh, Henry, you're so great. But we don't acknowledge God who baked the cake. You understand what I'm saying. But became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That is, honestly, verse 22 there, when you watch TV or the news, that's, just think of verse 22, professing themselves to be wise. Right? And you wouldn't want to read those three last words. They became fools. Hmm. Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. And this started, by the way, all the way back there at Sinai. And it's continued ever since. We can't wait. This invisible God, if I can't see him, I need something else. So for the children of Israel, it was to create the golden calf. And for generations thereafter, it was, I know I collect antiquities, carved wooden objects, mostly like phallic symbols, some of them representing fertility cults, but all to venerate and to worship to and to pray and to praise and to bow down before, but not the living God. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. You're going to remember that. Gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Is that not what the verse 5 of Colossians, after I explained it, mortify therefore, and all that's explained therein, has to do with the proper respect of one's body? Now listen, I'm not here to tell you how to live, all right? I'm not here to tell you um, the how-tos of whatever. 
we're looking at God's Word and trying to understand what brings on the wrath of God and why, which is an age-old question. Man, I would just love for God to just pour it out right now. Don't wait. I'm impatient. Some people are impatient for gifts. I'm impatient for that to happen. And I'm telling you. You know, people don't think about this. For example, when Nadab and Abihu were consumed or when the ground opened up with Korah's rebellion. These are all microcosms of God's reacting to someone who's been given the opportunity and given the honor, and you just basically treat it like it's garbage. No respect. This is why the book of Hebrews talks about don't be like that profane person Esau. What does that mean? Not discerning spiritual things. And spiritual things are not all about this syrup and ceremony that I've been talking about for weeks. It's about true worship between the individual as a relationship between me and my God and you and God. That's the way it works. So you keep reading here. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covenants. Do you see the connection between what's being said here and what Paul's writing in Colossians 3? It's important to understand they are not separated ideas. These are problems that not only for Paul's generation, but clear through the last many hundreds of years have been misunderstood. God is not saying, and forgive me, I know we have young folks, but... If you're in here, you're able to listen and mature enough to understand what I'm saying. God did not say that relations between a man and a woman are evil. He did not say that they are bad. He did not say that there's some corruption that occurs. In fact, he says he made this estate. He designed it this way when he made first man and first woman. Uh, The question really, if you sift all this down, is going to be filled with the concept of God's reaction to us going our own way, but in fact, it's more than that, because us going our own way is just sin, but sin left unchecked, sin left, we'll say, unconfessed, uh, unrecognized, undisturbed, unmolested, brings about this, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, Whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And he goes on to say, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art, that judgest. Now, All I'm saying to you is from our passage, the need to understand this concept and rightly understood. You know, Paul says elsewhere, we are, we are not recipients of that wrath. So I I want to keep reiterating this so that my listener audience is not going, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? You're not part of it. But it must be understood that God does not sit on his throne with his hands behind his back saying, I can't do anything. Things are being accumulated right now. God is not looking at me and saying, Sinner, wrath is coming upon you. Okay? He knows my frame, what he expects of me. God's not winking at my sin, but what God expects of me is to talk to him, confess my sin to him, tell him about me. That's our relationship. And for that communication and for that trust... God says, I took all that wrath when I hung on the cross. I took it all for you. Now, personalize it. I personalize it for me. You personalize it for you. I took all that wrath for you while I was on the cross so that you could be 
in union with me, identify with me. And for that purpose, wrath will not fall upon you. You're safe in him. He's like the ark. We enter into him, and in the ark, Noah and his family were safe. We are in him. We're safe. So don't want anybody leaving here going, oh, my goodness. But what should be reverberating and talked about and discussed is God's reaction to, we'll call it inappropriate behavior, that is what Paul is looking at. Now, somebody listening to me will say, well, you know, I I like all the preaching that you do and all the teaching that you do on the doctrinal things, but this makes me uncomfortable. Guess what? It makes me uncomfortable too. That means that there's something for all of us to try and figure out why does why do certain topics make us uncomfortable? Is it the uneasiness of the subject? Is it that we, we are ignorant in some degree or another? Because once we wrap our minds around it, there's something very comforting that comes to me. The knowledge. You know, the scripture that over and over is repeated through the Old into the New Testament, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I always used to think that meant that person's going to get theirs. But you know what it means? That person's going to get theirs. <laughs> That person is not my problem, and that person is not your problem. You are your own problem with God. And if we all took it upon ourselves to look at ourselves and deal with ourselves with God, we'd have a lot less time for a lot of the other stupidities that we do, and I include myself, and probably a lot more time to grow in our wisdom, understanding, and faith in him. Now, for those people, and I'm going to wrap up, Just real quickly here. For those people who say, well, then what is it that I should know? I'm going to take you to an Old Testament passage to close the message. Isaiah 33. You might think, that's pretty weird. You're going backwards to finish a message? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. It happens that way sometimes. You've got to go backwards to go forwards. So in Isaiah 33, and I'm specifically looking at verse 15, but let me read verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? The answer, he that walketh righteously or in righteousness, and I'll put this in a New Testament perspective, he that walketh in Christ. Okay? Okay? So you don't have to think about what this means. Who walks in Christ? And, and I say that just kind of very, it's very plain. Uh, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions uh, or deceits, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from, see, from, the seeing, from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. Now, listen, I'm not... I'm not talking to you today about act right, be right, do right. We're talking about, plain and simple, rejecting God and the behavior that God sees. It may not appear to us that we are rejecting with certain behaviors, but indeed we do. Because what we're saying is much like go back to the analogy of the parent with the child. The parent bought the furniture, bought the home, brings uh, food into the house, the child is taken care of by the parent, right? Everything in that instance for that young child who's not capable is done by the parent. Now, it'd be pretty crummy if you raised your child, did all this for your child. You don't do this for this reason, but if your child didn't turn around and recognize that, yes, you brought them into the world and you had a responsibility to do so, but there should also be gratitude that my parent loved me and took care, which is a natural occurrence, should happen anyway, but there should be gratitude there. Now bring all of what I said into the spiritual realm and see yourself as a child of God, which you are, and ask yourself, what is your relationship to the Father? Is it looking unto him and saying, thank you, Father, for all the blessings, for guiding my feet, for instructing me, for giving me wisdom and knowledge, and recognizing that he is in charge, and he is guiding your steps, and he is the light under your feet. Or are you one of those that says, like the psalmist says, only the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. And maybe for you, there is no God. And maybe for you, all the things of God is foolishness and stupidity. 
I got one thing to tell you on that. We will find out. We will all find out. You know, you could say, I could tell you, take my word. No, we'll all find out. There'll be a day. We don't all die at the same time, but there'll be a day when we all stand at the same time. And I'm sure we'll be looking around and we'll see faces we thought in a million years shouldn't be standing and others that we will say, where is that person? And they won't be there. These are the things to consider, to never get too complacent in your ideas or your ideology of what you understand to perniciously pervert the idea that somehow God is out to get you and God some, some malicious killjoy when in fact God in his love pours out his wrath and shows his displeasure as he did in the Bible and as he will do in the future to let us who are in Christ know our trust in Christ was not in vain and that God's word and his plan for humankind will stand regardless of who says yes and who says no. But in the meantime, I choose to do what I've done and what many of you have done, which is to walk by faith, to hold these words as absolute truth, and to realize that it is God's prerogative. And if he wasn't a God who could pour out wrath, he could not be a God of mercy and a God of love and a God of power that will take us as we are and into his blessed kingdom forever. Can't complain about that. Sure, looking forward to it right now. I can tell you, if you are still confused, I don't think I can help you much on the subject, but if I gave you some clarity, praise God, and go out of here knowing that you are not a recipient of God's wrath. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.